key word in a, this email as a part of her or part of this crime, and she's going to tell you if she did it or not. And so the first thing is uh, the opening line is this is an email for everyone. I'd like for everyone. I'd like to get it out and not have to repeat myself a hundred times. Well, she's she's telling you I'm going to get it out. I'm tr- I'm confessing for the whole world to see. And you read through her denial. Key denials are very important. And so, so when she has to de- to tell you the truth, she'll often resort to I didn't. I didn't uh, do this, I didn't do that, and so here she says, and I don't want to repeat myself a hundred times. She's going to repeat her thought prints uh, more than a hundred times in this document. And so, uh, you know, and then she says, I'm going to do this like I've been having to do with the police station. Understand she is the police. She's got this inner policeman that must tell the truth, and her bottom line truth is she's going to tell you, this is what was done to me, and this is why I murdered and so she goes on, just images of, I can't say what I'm about to say, I can't say to journalists or newspapers. Now, journalists and newspapers are symbolic messages of this letter. She's the journalist in this letter. She's, she's the newspaper, and she's telling you. And, and she then makes a slip, and I require that. She wants to, her, whoever to listen to, to keep it secret. And she says, I require that of N1, A-N-W-O-N-E, instead of anyone. N1. And one killer, one killer, it's really A-N, separate the word one, there's one leader in this crime. And and she gives you a lot of these what I call message markers. There's information here, and then she makes in the end of the first paragraph, this is this is what I saw in the Ramsey case. I wrote the book, Who Will Speak for John Bonet? That came out of the opening lines of the ransom note where they talked about uh, we represent a small foreign faction in the Ramsey case. We are speaking as a lawyer, as an inner truth-telling lawyer. We're going to tell you the story in the John Bonnet Ramsey case. So I read like that, and I just start, okay, she's going to tell me something. So this is what Amanda did. She says, this is M account. Now, understand her slip. This is M account of how I found my roommate murdered the morning of Friday, November 2nd. She immediately, in the very first paragraph, gets into the word murdered. So she's telling you a very vicious image, and she says, this is M account. Well, M is, uh, you know, it's not only my account. She meant to say my, but she put M account. I read that immediately. Why why the slip, crucial slip, and the unconscious makes these brilliant slips? This is Meredith's account. She's speaking for her victim, and this is what she, she's killed her, and she's trying to tell you. Now, uh, uh, this is, I'm speaking for her. Now, if the letter unfolds, and she says uh, of how I found my roommate murdered, this morning of Friday, November 2nd. Read it another way. Read it just a little bit more. This is Meredith's account. I'm speaking for Meredith of how I found my, or of how, just skip the word, I found my roommate murdered. Skip the word I, drop, I mean, drop found, I, my roommate murdered. This is Meredith's account of how I, of how I, my roommate murdered the morning of Friday, November 2nd. Now, that's my hypothesis. But she's speaking for a victim. I see this over and over. goes back to Shakespeare and Lady Macbeth. And so then you have, the, it will unfold how she's speaking for a victim. And she goes through and gives us her what happened. And she goes through and gives us her motives and so forth. And she, she does that. And I can tell you where she goes from there. But uh, let, me, let me stop there if you want to ask me. Yeah, it's so any. in depth. <laughs> it is in depth. Oh, yeah. This is a un, well. Where she goes, let me just tell you where she goes from there. Immediately, she goes to images of her roommate being asleep. I think asleep, death. Uh, she, and she makes numerous slips. And she says uh, she was fumbling around. Amanda now is fumbling around in the kitchen. Remember, a kitchen knife is crucial in this in this thing because that's what Amanda stabbed her with. There were. There were four stab wounds, two major ones, two to three major. The ones on the right side of the neck where Rafael Celesito was, who carried around like switchblades. But the brutal stab was on the left side of the neck facing her. So it was on the left side of her neck. So man is on one side and Rafael's on the other. Now I'm jumping ahead, but when she stabbed her, it was a vicious, vicious stab with a kitchen knife. And, I mean, that unfolds later, but uh, that's what she's trying to tell you. Um, that she was fumbling around with a kitchen weapon, and then what is, where does she go next? She says, well, the, then, then Meredith, this is the last time, quote, she saw Meredith. Now, understand, the last time she saw Meredith 
was when she truly saw blood on her chin after she had stabbed her. I mean, that's when she died. So where did she go? She said, the last time I saw her was she emerged from her room, just say she was in her room, with the blood of 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 a vampire from the night, you know, it was uh, it was a uh, um, uh, Halloween, uh, which was very symbolic. It was the night of the vampires in Perugia, the biggest party night of the year, the biggest night of the year in Perugia. And it says um, uh, she emerged with the blood of a vampire dripping down her chin. That's where the injury was. It was a huge. That's where the stab wound was. It got the, you know, that's where it got the uh, the thy- right thyroid artery. Now from the left side, she comes in and comes all the way across, cuts the right thyroid artery, and that was the one that bled profusely. And but she's already gone there. And so I'm thinking, okay, my hypothesis is being validated, but I got to hear it more. And she goes through and through the letter and repeatedly gives you images of, re- repeatedly talks about blood and things like that. So, uh, and gives you images of, she'll go down here and talk about, well, when I pierce my ears, now you just read that, she's piercing flesh. Uh, I mean, here's Amanda, and there's blood all around. And, you know, and then she goes through other other images that are very key, like what was her trauma, and she she takes you back to her major trauma in this letter. Now, you know, we've only touched on Liz about uh, probably three um, percent uh, of this email. I mean, this is just the opening paragraph, but she is announcing what she's going to tell you. So, it's very detailed work, and 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 they use markers in here like. Uh, like, I can't say, okay, you read through the denial, I can say, and then she gives you another marker, journalist, newspaper, information, account. All of these are communication references that I start to see the unconscious mind is going to validate its messages by saying, okay, here, I'm going to give you communication references. And I started to you know, call these message markers. So it's what it does, the unconscious mind, the superintelligence says, look, I'm going to first tell you that I'm communicating in a very special way. I'm then going to give you images of murder. I'm going to give you images of vampire. And then I'm going to validate it with more images of what I just validated with more images of pay attention to this communication. So that's how it does it. And it validates its its work, and then it repeats itself. And if you remember, her opening line said, I, I don't want to say this a uh, hundred times. Read to the denial. She's going to tell you over and over this same pattern. And she's going to give you the same thing, message markers saying this is important, and then she's going to give you the violent images, and then she's going to say, now pay attention. And, uh, you know, she closes her email with with telling the authorities, go back and basically read this document. And she's going to make reference to forensic documents that were left in the house, and she's going to talk about the forensic document in this email. If you understand it, this is a forensic document. They never understood this. This letter went to court. They didn't have anybody that knew how to decode it. This is very new work. It's just the cutting edge of the mind. Uh, You know, the FBI took us so far in profiling, and now we're coming in as the experts in uh, communication. They're not trained. They're not therapists. All my work came out of being a therapist, and that's where I learned it over 35 years, and they they have none of that. They've never done one therapy hour. They've never, they don't know a superintelligence exists. So that's what we're basing this on, and, you know. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, so we have we only have about five minutes left. I know we could, right. we could talk for a long oh, time. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but now about, so far, her saying, repeating this over and over again, that is exactly right. what's happened in the media right. uh, and with, so many people, including um, FBI profilers, who have written books about this case, like John Douglas. Correct. Right. Exactly. Uh, you said you don't well, know, necessarily agree with that. Well, no, no. I, look, uh, D- Douglas unconsciously will tell you the exact opposite. I mean, I'm looking at I'm looking at his works now. He he wrote two books on the case where he alluded to this case. One was about the case, the forgotten killer. He says, Rudy Gaudet, uh, Gertie is the way, uh, the, I believe it's pronounced, Rudy Gertie did it, a single killer, and and uh, Douglas talks about people who get target fixation, and he talks about how the uh, uh, Italian authorities lived in fantasy land. L- let, me, let me cut to the chase. Douglas is confessing that he had target fixation. 
He, he knew too much about this case coming into it. He didn't come into it neutral, and he he knew about this criminal Rudy Gerday, and 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 it was a, it's you know he read it as a as a slam dunk. He got target fixation, and he talked about how police can get target fixation and get overly invested in their abilities. I think he was, and it's he was overly invested in being right. Now what he does is to go back. And he he reads crime scenes from a distance. He may go over it. He may look at the films, but he's trying to to decode it. And he gives you all the meaning, like what this means of the of the uh, break in in the room. And this was not staging. He missed the whole thing that this was staging. He he didn't think like a policeman that that uh, that. Uh, it was so ob- everything looked to on the surface. I can see how he thought of, this was a, it was a staged burglary. Like Rudy uh, uh, Gertie was left his fingerprints there and all of that, uh, and and he blamed it on that single that single killer. He didn't think like a cop. He didn't think like it's too obvious. Look deeper, and and there were a lot of contradictions with the crime scene and what he reported. But uh, the the deal was that he should have. There was there was much more evidence, and he should have thought it's too obvious. Look deeper, and he tried to tell himself that. But uh, you know, so it's a new method. But I did want to end on this. I mean, Amanda takes you through this letter, and she gives you what she did, and she gives you repeated vampire images. She'll make a slip like I talked to the poli, P O L I E, and uh, she meant to say police. But she's trying to tell you, I'm consciously lying to the police, look at my lies, and, and so forth. And she'll keep referring to lies. But then she took you to images of, of uh, which I went through and which matches her history, your earlier question. She takes you image, to images of her core trauma. And her co- Amanda had a, which is what we see in killers often, they've been very abused and then they become abusers. It's like bullies become or they're bullied, and, and, and then they become bullies because they feel very helpless, and then they must take out their pain on others. I'm convinced BTK did that. I could show it that. I could show you that. And that has never been reported on. I will report on that one day. I think I know what his his core abuse was. But Amanda had a major abuse that no, that people are, are missing. And, uh, you know, her major abuse had to do with her parent parental circumstances and a casual affair, and they waited five months to get married, I'm convinced, and she gives you in this letter numerous images of near abortion, and a near abortion in her mind, uh, and I've worked with victims of that, uh, remember, now she lived, and so she's got to, she's got this thought deep in her mind that I cannot, be, speaking for her, I cannot believe my parents almost took my life. And her father and mother uh you know, uh, quickly divorced. Father leaves mother for another woman, and and uh, down the street within a year of Amanda's birth, and so she has all this other abandonment. But Amanda, in her own way, uh, I mean, there were other immediate motives. Uh, there are always two motives. There there are immediate trigger motives, and there were several trigger motives. I think there's one primary, one that stood out that last night. But she had a time bomb motive, and she was waiting to go off, and I think she repeated what was done to her. And that's where the title came from, is Done Unto You. She was doing to her victim what was nearly done to her, and trauma victims, these near traumas get frozen in their mind, like a war veteran, you know, their their, their war experience where they're nearly kill, nearly killed gets frozen in their mind. And in her mind, this trauma was frozen, and I think... I think this kitchen knife, horrific stab wound on the left side of her neck, unlike the other three, two two different knives, which Douglas missed, and this vicious stab wound, I think she was recreating what happened with the uh, in her mind with the uh, near abortion, that, that she, she envisioned herself as that happening to her. And in one sense, when a trauma happens that's so close to dying, you believe it happened, and that's what soldiers come back and tell me. You know, I, I was as good as dead, and I could tell you that from other trauma victims. So, once you have a near-death trauma, it becomes frozen in your mind, and that's you know, it's a very deep level of the psyche. That's the level I work at, and so that's that's kind of the knock story, that just the thumbnail sketch. Yes, and that's really just the tip of the iceberg, right? There's so much more in your book, as done unto you, which is available on Amazon.com. Dr. Hodges, thank you for being on True Crimes Podcast. 
Thank you, Liz. Okay, have a good day. Bye.